for the September 6, 2022 joint meeting of the Eugene and Lang County Planning Commissions. I'm now calling this meeting of the Eugene Planning Commission to order. My name is Dan Isaacson and I'm the Vice Chair of the Eugene Planning Commission and I will be presiding over tonight's meeting and public hearing in the absence of Kev Beeson, the Eugene Planning Commission Chair. I am joined by my fellow Eugene Planning Commissioners and I'd like to have them introduce themselves. Start with Lisa. Sure. Um, my name is Lisa Fragola, and I'm a City of Eugene Planning Commissioner. Great to see everybody this evening. Commissioner Ramey. Good evening. It's great to see everybody. I'm a City of Eugene Planning Commissioner. Thank you, Commissioner Edwards. Everybody, Tiffany Edwards with Eugene Planning Commission. And Chair Tingham, to you. Thank you. Uh, my name is Steve Dignam, Chair of the Lane County Planning Commission. I'll call this meeting of the Lane County Planning Commission to order. Jared, can you call roll? Yes, I can. I'm going off the roster, Commissioner Kaler. I'm Charles C. Kaler, Lane County Commissioner. Commissioner Stephen Dignam. Here. Betsy Schultz contacted me that she will be absent. Kathy Smith is so far absent. And Christian Wittall contacted me stating that he is also going to be absent. And Commissioner Bruce Hadley. He gave us a here. I saw his hand. Perfect. Thank you. Commissioner Eliza Kishinsky. Here. Commissioner Joni Peacock. Here and Commissioner Steven Snyder. Thank you. Thanks, back to you, Daniel. Thank you. Thank you for joining us in this remote meeting format we're using in response to the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic. This format enables the Planning Commission to meet, hear from the community, and take care of business while keeping our members, staff, and the public safe. Anyone wishing to access and participate in the meeting can do so by following the access instructions listed in the agenda for this meeting. Eugene Planning, Commission's, uh, the Eugene Planning Commission meetings can also be viewed by watching the live stream available on our website or broadcast on Comcast Channel 21. Tonight, we are holding both a work session and a public hearing on proposed revisions to land use code regulations that apply to development in the floodplain. If you wish to speak or provide and provide testimony at the public hearing tonight, please know that we will begin the public hearing portion of tonight's meeting after we hold a work session on the topic, including a presentation from staff. When we are ready to begin the public hearing, staff will provide instructions about the virtual hearing format and how to participate. The regulations we are discussing tonight apply to two geographic lo uh, locations, the area within the city limits of the city of Eugene and the area of Lane County that is located between the Eugene city limits and the Eugene urban growth boundary. We are conducting this work session and hearing jointly with the Lane County Planning Commission because the city and the county have adopted identical floodplain regulations for these geographic areas. And as staff will explain in a few minutes, FEMA has required that these floodplain regulations be updated. For the public's convenience and government efficiency, we are considering the updates together. To provide some context, the planning commissions are not the final decision makers on this matter. After the two planning commissions have reviewed the proposed amendments, relevant material provided by city and county staff, and any testimony we receive from the public, each planning commission will make a recommendation to its own set of elected officials, Eugene City Council and the Lane County Board of Commissioners. The City Council and the County Board will then consider their planning commission's recommendations and they, hold, they will hold their own joint public hearing before making their final decisions on the amendments. I'd like to now introduce our project manager, Jack Blackham, from Eugene Public Works Engineering Division to begin our work session. Jack. Thank you, Commissioner Isaacson. And hello, everyone. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen, and I'll uh, start in on the presentation. And can I get a verbal confirmation that you can see my screen? Yes. Great. Thanks so much. 
Well, thank you everybody for being here today. Um, as Commissioner Isaacson said, we are here to discuss the proposed floodplain development code amendment um, that will seek to comply with the National Flood Insurance Program or the NFIP minimum standards. Um, introducing the team working on this, I'm Jack Blackham. I am the permitting and floodplain manager with the City of Eugene Public Works Department uh, uh, engineering side. Uh, Jeff Gepper, who's not here today, is our land use code lead. He's a senior planner with planning and development. Um, Gabe Flock has is joined us today in his place. Our legal counsel is Emily Jerome, who is the deputy city attorney with the city of Eugene. And then on the Lane County side, we have Jared Bowder, who is the project manager. Um, Jared's an associate planner with Lane County. So as we discussed, the code amendments uh, here pertain to development in the floodplain, both on city and county land within the Eugene urban growth boundary. So the Eugene floodplain development code amendment would only apply to those annexed lands within city limits. Um, however, the unannexed areas that are within the UGB also need to comply. Uh, this includes the urban transition area and clear lake. So with this, uh, we as city staff have been coordinating with Lane County to update the floodplain code applicable in the unannexed urban growth boundary lands on the same schedule as the city code update. Uh, that's why we're here in a joint meeting to, today. Um, so those are the impacted areas. Uh, after this work session and public hearing, uh, city, staff, city staff have scheduled times to meet separately with each individual planning commission for recommendations and action on the proposed floodplain development code amendments. Uh, these are scheduled for October 11th with the Eugene Planning Commission and November 15th with the Lane County Planning Commission. Uh, with those recommendations from each planning commission, city staff will then schedule and hold a joint public hearing and work session with elected officials of both the Eugene City Council as well as the Lane County Board of Commissioners. Uh, and we tentatively have that for early 2023. After that hearing, we will again meet with each of those bodies separately uh, for their action to adopt the code amendment. Um, as, a, as a, another item, notices and invitation for this public hearing were mailed out to property owners in and or near the current and future floodplain. Uh, future notices and invitations for public hearing when staff meet with the Eugene City Council and Lane County Board of Commissioners uh, will also be mailed and posted to the project webpage. So before we get started, I just wanna go over a few of the key terms and organizations uh, involved and commonly referred to in this presentation and that, that we work with in floodplain management. So first is FEMA and FEMA is the Federal Emergency Management Agency. Uh, FEMA oversees the National Flood Insurance Program or NFIP for the entire United States. Uh, DLCD is the Oregon Department of Land Conservation and Development and they are in charge of coordinating and implementing the NFIP within the state of Oregon. Um, and then the floodplain, it's, a, it's probably a word that many of us have heard, uh, but for us, it's the area, land area, inundated by the 1% annual chance flood event. You might also have heard this referred to as the 100 year event. Um, the special flood hazard area is where NFIP regulations apply. Uh, the, flood, the special flood hazard area is the area mapped as the floodplain on flood insurance rate maps. So the base flood elevation, the BFE, is the water surface elevation to which the base flood or this 1% annual chance event is expected to reach. Uh, these are very critical data for development in the special flood hazard area, the SFHA. Um, flood insurance rate maps, as I mentioned, or, or commonly referred to as FIRMS, are the official maps of a community on which FEMA has delineated the special flood hazard area, uh, the base flood elevations, risk zone, and other important information related to floodplain management. And finally, uh, flood insurance studies. Uh, those are the water course profiles, whereas the firms are more or less the horizontal extent of the BFE. Um, and again, 
flood insurance studies are critical, uh, critical items for developers and others in determining accurate base flood elevation at any given location where it may be available. So this is a project is meeting NFIP requirements for floodplain development code. So, so, and it's basically what is the NFIP? Uh, the NFIP was established with the passage of the National Flood Insurance Act of 1968. Um, it is a program that enables property owners in participating communities such as Eugene and Lane County to purchase flood insurance as protection against flood losses uh, while it also requires state and local governments to enforce floodplain management ordinances that aim to reduce future flood damage. Um, so as I mentioned, the DLCD coordinates the implementation of the NFIP in Oregon through an agreement with FEMA. Um, as part of the city's participation in the National Flood Insurance Program, DLCD conducts what they call Community Assistance Visits, or CAV, C-A-V, um, these community assistant visits are audits to ensure participating NFIP communities' floodplain regulations and processes are in compliance with the NFIP. So in 2020, uh, DLCD conducted a community assistant visit of the city of Eugene. Uh, they reviewed the city's floodplain program, including existing development code, uh, other regulations and floodplain regulations, and permitting processes for development in the special flood hazard area. Um, the result provided recommendations and requirements for the city to meet in order to remain a participant in the National Flood Insurance Program. Uh, one of these requirements to remain a participant was to adopt minimum standards for floodplain development as existing floodplain development code does not currently meet the minimum standards. So what are floodplains and special flood hazard area? These are two simple diagrams I'd like to talk about uh, briefly. With respect to the NFIP, as I said, floodplains are the land area inundated by the 1% annual chance event or base flood event or 100 year flood. Um, I think it's also really important for us to remember that river systems and floodplains are dynamic natural systems that are subject to changes based on climactic patterns and development among many factors. Um, floodplain management in general, however, aims to reduce flood losses to life and property while simultaneously protecting the national, natural functions they provide. Floodplain management involves regulatory, construction, and public education measures designed to avoid and minimize negative effects of development in special flood hazard areas or the floodplain. For the purposes of these code discussions and presentation, floodplain and SFHA can be considered synonymous. Um, so as we can see on the simplified diagram on the left, the floodplain is defined by the land area to where the base flood elevation rises. In this example, although the structure is still located within the horizontal floodplain, the structure appears to be above the base flood elevation from fill that has been placed within the floodplain. Um, however, the fill has been placed outside of the floodway. Um, the floodway is a very critical part of the floodplain. Um, we define this as the channel or the water course that must be reserved in order to discharge the base flood without cumulatively increasing the water surface elevation more than a designated height. So then we can look at the diagram on the right. And the diagram on the right shows the cumulative increase in elevation of both the 10-year flood events and the 100-year flood events, or the 1% annual chance flood. Um, over time, as the fill material has been placed within the floodplain, so the house up on the top left on the upper terrace that at one point was not subject to the base flood has been affected by the fill that has been placed within the floodplain and, in, and perhaps in other parts of the floodplain, and now that upper, upper terrace house will flood during the 100-year flood event. So all the flood zones um, are, are part of special flood hazard areas. Um, the low to moderate and, and all of the flood zones represent some varying degree of risk. 
Um, however, they are determined through a different level of analysis by FEMA. Um, so due to this, there are different regulations on the type of development and how that development may occur in each zone. So zone X represents a low to moderate risk. Um, this is also known as the 500-year event or the 0.2% annual chance event. Um, and then we move into the high-risk zone. So all of the zone A areas are considered high risk, and these are subject to the 1% annual chance flood event. Um, each zone includes varying amounts of information provided by FEMA, depending on the level of analysis, and thus, based on the amount of available information, um, there are different development requirements that must allow for those differences. So now I'll talk just briefly about the DLCD model flood hazard code. Um, and this is the code that we used to base our, our floodplain code amendments on. Um, so this model flood hazard code uh, was prepared by the Department of Land Conservation and Development and has been reviewed and approved by FEMA Region 10. So with adoption of this language, um, that, that the model code provides. We, uh, this will ensure compliance with the minimum NFIP standards and our continued participation in the NFIP. Um, the model code, code includes standards and provisions that encourage sound floodplain management. Uh, the language is based on the minimum requirements of the NFIP, and these can be found in the Code of Federal, Federal Regulations, the CFRs, uh, Oregon Statewide Land Use Planning Goal 7, and the Oregon Specialty Code. Um, so we're using the current version from October 2020, and although the code is written for adoption of minimum standards, uh, DLCD also provides uh, language for potential higher standards if a community chooses to incorporate them. And now floodplain permits. So when and where are, are floodplain permits required? Um, floodplain permits at their simple, simplest are, are the items that are necessary to conduct development within the special flood hazard area. Um, floodplain development permits are required for all new or substantially improved construction in the special flood hazard area. Uh, development uh, can include and does include any man-made change to improved or unimproved real estate that uh, includes but is not limited to buildings or other structures, filling, grading, paving, excavation, or storage of equipment or materials. Um, so for floodplain management and development code purposes, new construction is also permitted. Uh, and that means structures for which the start of construction commenced on or after the effective date of a floodplain management regulation um, and includes any, any further future improvements to that structure. Um, and then substantial damage and improvement, which are two big terms that, that play a very big role in floodplain development. Um, substantial damage is damage of any origin sustained by a structure, structure whereby the cost of restoring that structure to its before damaged condition would equal or exceed 50% of the market value of the structure before that damage occurred. Um, substantial improvement is any reconstruction, rehabilitation, addition, or other improvement of a structure, the cost of which equal or exceeds that same 50% threshold of the market value of the structure before the start of the construction of the improvement. Um, this term includes structures which have incurred substantial damage, regardless of the actual repair work uh, were performed. Um, and so now we get to the substantial updates. Uh, so while we did write these proposed, proposed code amendments, um, basing them on the tenets of meeting the minimum NFIP standard, uh, Certain cases meant updating existing floodplain development code language, and other cases that meant adopting completely new code language that was missing and was identified in the community assistance visit. Um, so these are the items that, that we were required to change. Uh, there are new notification requirements when community boundaries change, whether that be the city limits themselves within the urban growth boundary or the urban growth boundary itself. Um, we've included more robust and clarifying definitions for substantial damage and improvements. 
uh, also qualifications and potential exclusions that apply to these cases. Uh, there are also new provisions and requirements for substantial determinations by the floodplain administrator or their designee. Um, and then there are new floodplain specific construction standards for garages, tanks, manufactured dwellings, uh, recreational vehicles, appurtenant or accessory structures. Um, the new code provides clarifying definitions and regulations of how these items are to be constructed and permitted when they are located in the special flood hazard area. And so then there are also optional recommended items uh, included in the pr uh, proposed draft code. So we are proposing to maintain an existing, the existing freeboard requirement that is, that is already contained within uh, our floodplain development code. Um, very quickly, freeboard is a margin of safety that is added to the level of the base flood. Um, and the CRS score, uh, the CRS is a community rating system, which is a voluntary program that provides discounts on flood insurance premiums for residents both inside and outside the special flood hazard area. So anybody in the, within the urban growth boundary that gets a flood, that uh, elects to get flood insurance, um, we'll get a uh, we'll get a discount on that premium because of our involvement uh, and our participation in CRS. Um, we've also added a reasonably safe requirement for Zone A in place of freeboard um, because of the anal the the lack of detailed analysis for Zone A. They don't necessarily have base flood elevations determined. So we propose that when a structure is in the special flood hazard area, but there is no base flood elevation available or that can be determined, um, we require that the lowest floor of the structure be elevated to two feet above the highest adjacent grade exterior of that structure. Um, and then the submittal of new technical data for letter of map changes or LOMC. Um, so LM, LOMC, letter of map changes, uh, are a process that came about um, because based on the scale of work involved with production of a flood insurance rate map, uh, some areas can inadvertently be shown within a special flood hazard area, even though the property may be on natural ground or is at or above the base flood elevation. Um, so in recognition of this, FEMA has an administrative procedures to change the designation for some property uh, located on the flood insurance rate map. Um, and these are what we refer to, these processes are what we refer to as letter of map changes. Um, and so the proposed draft code uh, adds definition and clarity about what role the city plays in these processes and the data requirements from app applicants for them as it pertains to submitting to the city. Um, FEMA has their own own process uh, own process of, of application. Um, uh, um, excuse me. Um, application uh, how they how they review application review, um, and so we have uh, we've also added a requirement for applicants to be responsible for preparing all technical data to support those letter of map changes uh, processes, and then also paying uh, a processing or application fee that may be associated with them. Um, and then finally, um, we added a, an optional clause that, that the floodplain administrator shall be under no obligation to sign a community acknowledgement form, which is part of the letter of map change process and application. Um, until that applicant has demonstrated that the project has met the requirements of this code and all of the applicable state and federal permits related. So that is what is included in the floodplain development code. And now I just want to briefly talk about what is not included or affected in this uh, in the flood, uh, proposed floodplain development code. Um, so FEMA, as, as some of you may be aware, FEMA has issued preliminary new flood insurance rate maps for central Lane County and the incorporated areas. 
Uh, that is a completely separate project from these floodplain development code amendments. Uh, we will come back to this group when those maps are ready for adoption in the code as those maps uh, define the flood insurance rate maps and also the special flood hazard area. Um, so FEMA, as I said, FEMA has released those maps and the, the formal adoption process should, should uh, take place in late 2023 or early 2024. Um, the proposed floodplain development code amendments also do not affect current flood insurance policies or procedures for existing structures that will remain in their existing state. So if one just wants to continue living in their, in their home and they have no plans to do anything, then this, this, these proposed uh, floodplain development codes will not affect them. And then finally, uh, the letter of map changes. So all the letter of map amendments, letter of map revisions, and letter of map revisions based on fill, which are the, which are the official letter of map change processes, um, any of those that were issued under the current effective or previous firms and flood insurance studies will not be affected with the proposed code amendments here. Um, we did, as I mentioned, the, uh, add definitions of these as well as the submittal requirements, but any of the, the current letter of map changes that are considered valid by FEMA um, still apply in full. And so then what happens now? So we are at the top and we are at the Joint Planning Commission meeting uh, and public hearing. As I mentioned earlier, we will step through and we have scheduled uh, individual uh, Planning Commission date October 11th for the Eugene Planning Commission and November 15th for the Lane County Planning Commission, um, if necessary. Uh, and then after that, we will hold a joint elected officials meeting and another public hearing. Uh, that has not been scheduled officially yet, but we expect to be in, in very early 2023. Um, after that, we will then come back to those individual elected official boards, the uh, Eugene City Council as well as the Lane County Board of Commissioners meeting um, and ask for their actions. So this is a, just want to talk a little bit about how, how individuals can provide input and learn more. We have a city project webpage, which is posted here. It was also posted in the notice uh, mailed to, uh, mailed out. Um, I am happy to accept uh, any input to my email address, which I have listed there, or Jeff Geppers, which is listed here. Um, any written comments can be mailed to the planning division, which is listed at this address, 99 West 10th. Um, and it is also listed on the public notice. Um, we invite people to uh, provide their public testimony tonight at 6 p.m. after this work session and uh, at the future joint elected officials meeting uh, and hearing, which is will be in early 2023. Oh, I'm sorry. So that concludes our presentation. So at this time, um, if there are any questions from commissioners that we can take tonight or areas you may want more information on, we can take those. Um, in order to preserve time for public testimony this evening, any questions that we can't answer briefly, uh, we will we can plan on bringing you back that information in a technical memo at the subsequent meeting. So thank you very much. Thank you. Um, I'm looking for any questions. Um, I, I guess I'll take the Eugene side. Uh, if, uh, if, if uh, Commissioner Jigam, you wanna take the, the, the county side, it looks like you have uh, Commissioner Kaczynski. I'll just go ahead and take uh, it looks like Eliza is the only one with her hands up. So go yeah. ahead, Eliza. Uh, I probably have a fairly boring question. Um, I actually, my home is in the special flood ha hazard area. Is that a thing that I need to disclose as a potential conflict? Or I guess I just did disclose that my home was in the flood area. So, no. Yeah, I don't think uh, Lane County doesn't get legal counsel at their planning commissions. And so when we do things together, I'll often step in I'm, uh, city attorney's office from Eugene. And Eliza, this is a legislative matter. 
Mm -hmm. um, which makes it quite different from quasi-judicial where that may be an issue, but there are so many people impacted um, by these regulations, particularly uh, in Lane County. And because you are just one of those many people, and this is a legislative matter, um, thank you for letting us know. I assume you can be fair and impartial. Um, then you're not biased and everything's fine. And we appreciate your participation tonight. Thank you. Well, I raised my own hand, so I'll, I'll go ahead here. Uh, a question for Lane County staff. My recollection is that Lane County just did some fairly, at the planning commission level, some fairly extensive work on floodplain floodway matters. And can somebody perhaps fill me in on what, I know it was a couple of months ago, I don't remember all the details. What did we do and how does this relate to that? Yeah, thanks for that question. But there's been a lot of floodplain code update projects going on the past few years. The most recent one that you saw me for was a Lane County specific floodway only co proposed code update. This is similar to what the county did. I think it was 2019 where after our FEMA community assistance visit, the county was also required to bring our floodplain ordinances in conformance with the model code language. And so the county's already gone through that and that's what the city's doing tonight, if or initiating tonight, if that answered your question. So one quick follow-up then, I guess I haven't done a paragraph by paragraph comparison, but are the city code amendments consistent with what we recently approved? They would be, yeah. The county went for some higher regulatory standards that the city's not pursuing. Okay. But yeah. Um, Chair, yeah can't, oh, go ahead, Lindsay. Oh, Chair Dignam. Um, <clears throat> so uh, for the uh, uh, Eugene Planning Commission, I'm Lindsay Eichner, Principal Planner uh, for the county. And so uh, the regulations that are being proposed tonight are applicable within the urban growth boundary outside of city limits is what um, the Lane County Planning Commission is considering. So um, these will not affect the other regulations that the County Planning Commission and the Board of Commissioners have adopted outside of the urban growth boundary. So there's right, separate you. sections of code. Okay, other questions from Lane County Commissioners? We seem unusually quiet. I, I have another question, unless you, somebody on your side has one, Daniel. We do, Commissioner Lear. Yeah, I was just wondering um, which standards were different for the county versus those that are for the county and the city joint areas. If there's a way to summarize that, and it could, the answer could come later if that's not readily available. We can provide that later. I don't have all of um, the differences memorized, to be quite honest. I will, I, I'd like to just at least address that a little bit. Uh, because FEMA imposes these regulations, there's very little area where jurisdictions can choose to impose a stricter standard. And so the, you saw Eugene is proposing to maintain those where they're already being imposed, but may consider coming back, um, particularly at the time when mapping is, is, is revisited. And at that time, taking a look at maybe conforming some of the regulations with higher standards to the extent the county adopted them for rural areas. Um, at this point, there isn't a proposal to match uh, any higher higher uh, or more strict regulations that were imposed in the rural areas by Lane County. Um, we could certainly come back to you with a, a look at what those are and you could make some recommendations along those lines, but we would certainly wanna do some more public outreach and handle things probably a little bit differently if we decided or if you decided you wanted to make that recommendation at this point.
So I'll, I'll go ahead one more since I don't see any other hands up. Uh, parts of this seem pretty, seem so far to be cut and dried if we're just accepting the code amendment recommendations from DLCD. But uh, when we talked about the four optional recommended items, I'm assuming those would be something that perhaps when we get together in our individual respective bodies that we as Lane County Planning Commissioners would have a better chance to question and understand. I guess that question is for Jack. Jack, are you gonna be there when our group meets? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and th that, that would provide time. I think that there were four bullet points I listed. That, and, and again, you know, the first one of the free board requirement um, just to be clear, that's already, we already uh, apply that. That's already in our existing code. Um, the other ones were perhaps more administrative that we you know, recommend to include. Um, but yes, I'll certainly answer the question. Could certainly be there and speak more to those at the individual meeting if needed. Wait, uh, go ahead, Daniel. It looks like you have somebody there. Commissioner Lear. Yeah, so just to clarify, uh, and this could be to Jack, so are these recommendations from the city staff based on the DLCD recommendations or are they coming right from the state? Um, these are, these are um, so these are recommendations that are, that are, you know, if, if the state had their way, they would, we would adopt the highest regulatory standards possible. Um, but this is, these are, the ones that we have included are the language that were included in the DLCD model code. It just was uh, slightly above the minimum. So does that, does that answer your question? So the city staff looked at the DLCD model code and maybe went a step above kind of the minimum? That, yeah, correct. Okay, thanks. Bruce Hadley? Yeah. I Question just out of idle curiosity on your 11th slide, Jack, uh, floodplain specific construction standard, and then there were five items listed, one of which was recreational vehicles. Why is that? That was, that was mainly due to the definition and how uh, FEMA defines uh, recreational vehicles as they pertain or as they're located in the floodplain. So if I park a motorhome beside my house that's a consideration for fema uh it may be yes huh okay thank you and, and it goes to if, if if it's being regularly occupied right and what the occupancy of that recreation okay and would hookups matter too i mean i mean does that it, it may because there's yeah equipment and mechanical facilities that might be um, you know, without knowing the specifics of, of might be affected by a flood. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, yeah. Gotcha. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I have one more, one last question. I, I always get a kind of a jittery feeling whenever anything looks this cut and dried that I'm, that I'm missing something. Who, who do you think, who do we think might conceivably be hurt by this action? What property owners, I'm, I expect we might hear from that in the public hearing, but what kind of property owner is going to look at this uh, new code amendment and perhaps uh, be worried about the impact on their property? I'll just jump in and say this isn't a mapping project, so it'll only the code updates will only affect people who are already regulated by the floodplain ordinances of the city. So yeah. does that mean? Are you saying you don't think anyone is going to feel concern, additional concern? No, I was trying to touch on there won't be any new pro new properties affected that aren't already regulated by the floodplain ordinances. Oh, is I more what I was speaking to. I got you. Um, I think I'll maybe flip the coin and say that if we don't do this, 
many community members will be negatively impacted if the city is no longer able to participate in the community rating system and lose any flood insurance discounts and things of that nature that they might already be receiving. Of course, and that's why I said it seems kind of cut and dried, but that, like I said, that also makes me worry. Charles C. Kaler. Speaking of mapping, when was the last time the mapping was updated? June 2nd, 1999 for much of the county, and there's a mapping project that's currently kicking off right now, actually. For the, count, for the county or the city, which? Uh, both, Central Lane County. What are the results of that expected? Do you know? The public outreach process meetings are in October to like, those are the very first public meetings for where the public can give input on the draft maps. Okay, thank you. There's an alternator. Oh, sorry, go ahead. Oh, I yeah. just, wanted to, just wanted to hop that there's a, there's a, 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 a separate, as far as the mapping goes, there's also a separate uh, FEMA appeal period process that doesn't have to do with the city. And then they will then issue the final maps. And then we would then, uh, as the city, and community then take the necessary steps to adopt those maps into code. So they expect it to have they expect that to happen late 2023 or early 2024. Stephen. Thanks. Um, I don't know if this is the work session for it or when, when we break into our small groups. Uh, I guess I, I read through the draft of the code and um we've got i don't know i feel like i'm uh following in bruce's footsteps a little bit we've got some uh, i guess nitpicks and and more general comments and questions on the the code specifically but not on what you talked about today is today the time for that is the work session the time for that is it collected all and send it an email to you um since that's a process question i'll i'll um, address it. And yes, I have noticed the same thing. And um, we would happily accept a redlined or a, uh, annotated version of any of that that you'd like to share. Much of that, um, as, as we always do, when we, before we present a planning commission recommendation to the city council, we, we will look through and make typographical corrections, um, grammatical corrections, anything you need um, to make it clear what the recommendation is, um, we'll usually incorporate the changes at that point. So to the extent you've already kind of, like me, with a red pen in hand, can't help it, made some marks on that, we'd happily accept those. If you want to forward them uh, to Jared, he can get them to us. Okay. I mean, I did have a couple of questions on like, on some definitions or clarifications um, that weren't strictly like typos or grammatical I mean, I things, think but... You should ask those questions now if you have them, just because the, you know they may be beneficial to Eugene planning commissioners as well. Um, so I think those questions can be asked now. You are gonna have a public hearing tonight. And so there'll also be time after the public hearing to ask some questions. Um, and you know, if, if anyone comes to the hearing, you may have additional questions at that point. So either right now before the hearing or you can save them for after, but I think tonight really is the time to ask. Bring up okay, Stephen. We have twelve minutes. We have twelve minutes before the hearing, so why not do it now? Sure thing. Um, so I'll, I'll skip over the, like you said, the red line nature things. But um, I did have a comment on uh, kind of going back to the recreational vehicles um, in the. I, I didn't write down my section notes very well here, but yeah, I believe it was in the definition of recreational vehicle, um, part two, section. Uh, sorry. Number two, sub letter C, um, they talk about recreational vehicles being something that's towed by a light duty truck. Um, and maybe maybe light duty versus heavy duty truck is defined somewhere else. And I'm thinking about this, but that seems to like specifically exclude gooseneck RVs, you know, the, some of the bigger RVs, um, which I don't believe is the intent of the definition. Um, and sometimes, uh, I think there was covered in the definitions, but sometimes they're, they're using manufactured homes. Sometimes they're using manufactured dwellings. 
I believe that they're supposed to mean the same thing, but it's not always clear in context whether that's true or not. Um, and then finally, just uh, in the definition sections you're at the beginning, you have the area of special flood hazard is defined. Um, but then later on, and then basically throughout the whole document, you use special flood hazard area. And um, when I've been on uh, like standards writing committees in the past, it's always like use your definition as you use the term throughout the document. So having it defined in a different way is, is confusing. Um, like I said, the rest of the stuff I have here of notes are just um, like errata, you know, red line nature. But those are the, the things that I could see as bigger questions. Thank, thank, I guess I'll just take a quick um, yeah, stab at those. The uh, manufactured home and dwelling that, you know, as you probably saw that in the definition, it lists them as home and dwelling is synonymous, but yes, clarity can certainly um, be, be implemented. Um, like, and I, I think it's also important to remember that these definition, these definitions are also, you know, verbatim for, from the model code, right? So, so we can certainly make changes. Those changes then would need to be, you know, however small vetted through the LCD and the FEMA process. Um, I, I would understand light duty truck to mean anything. Uh, yeah, I, I, I think that maybe a, a clarity on definition of that could be important, um, especially if that's how we're defining something that that might be towing something that many of us may have or that might be common throughout the special flood hazard area. So, so thank yeah, thank you for those comments. Daniel, what do you think about a short break? I'm open to uh, dealer's choice on that. I think uh, we can power through, but that's entirely up to your your, your team. Uh, well, if we don't have any other questions, I mean, we could take a break before the seven o'clock. Linda, are, is anyone signed up at this point? So no one signed up at this point, but we haven't gone over um, how to provide public testimony, so. Oh, right, okay. Yeah, let's just do a, a, a quick um, nine minutes, come back, uh, well, let's do eight minutes so that we're back two minutes prior to, excuse me, seven minutes. So we're back two minutes prior to the top of the hour so that we can begin right on the, on the stroke of seven. So can we just um, mute and turn cameras yeah. off and uh as much as i hate to do this to you linda can you babysit for us and stay on okay uh yeah i don't want to have to everybody to have to kind of reconnect so okay. that's fine all right see you back in now six minutes
staff for, active, for proactively reaching out to potential homeowners as well as uh, as well as those identified who were impacted by these conversations. It really shows the commitment to uh, outreach both by staff at the city of Eugene and Lane County. Before we open the public hearing, I wanted to get let the public know a little bit about the planning commissions and our role. We are unpaid volunteers appointed by the Eugene City Council and the Lane County Board of Commissioners. As planning commissioners, we're committed to balancing all of the community's needs and to making the best recommendations we possibly can based on the city and county policies and Oregon laws for us and for future generations. Well, that can be pretty tough to do, and we know not everyone will agree with every recommendation we make. I wanna thank everyone for their patience and their flexibility as we work within this virtual meeting format. As always, feel free to contact staff if there are or is any testimony you were not able to provide or wish to provide in a different manner. I would like to invite our moderator, Linda Baker, to provide instructions on how to get into the queue for providing verbal testimony at tonight's hearing. Linda? Linda, we can't hear you. We can't hear you. Okay. Can you hear me now? <laughs> okay, good. So hello everyone, I'm Linda Baker and I will be the moderator for tonight's meeting. I'm gonna cover a few housekeeping items before we begin with regular proceedings. Firstly, I wanna thank everyone for joining us in this virtual hearing and note that tonight's hearing is being recorded. Since we're meeting virtually, I'm going to provide instructions on how to request to speak during the public testimony section. When staff announces that it's time for testimony, you can get in the queue by raising your virtual hand. To do this, please click the raise hand button in the menu if you're joining us on computer, tablet, or smart device. If you're joining us by phone, you must dial star nine. At the beginning of testimony, you should start by stating your name, address, and whether you are in support, opposition, or neutral to the proposal. Public testimony time is three minutes long. I will provide you a time reminder when you have 30 seconds left to speak, and once the time is up, you will be returned to attendee status. More instructions will be provided prior to the beginning of the public testimony section of our hearing tonight. With that, it is great to have everyone here tonight, and I will hand it back to the Eugene Planning Commission Chair. Thank you, Linda. As Linda just presented, if you would like to speak and you have not already raised your hand, please raise your hand, your virtual hand now and get to get into the queue. Testimony presented at this public hearing should be directed toward the applicable approval criteria or other criteria that the speaker believes apply to the decision. The applicable approval criteria for the proposed land use code amendments are from sections 9.8065 of both Eugene Code and the Lane County Code of the Urban Transition Area. In general, the approval criteria require that any code changes must be consistent with the applicable statewide planning goals, the Metro Plan, and any applicable refinement plans. Staff have prepared findings to demonstrate that that is the case with the proposed amendments. Those are included in the materials for this meeting. With that, I'm now opening the public hearing for the Eugene Planning Commission, and I invite Chair Dingham to open the public hearing for Lane County. Thank you. And yes, indeed, I will open the public hearing for the Lane County Planning Commission. So, moderator, how many speakers do we have in the queue? Well, we currently do not have any speakers in the queue. Um, I just want to remind everyone that you can raise your virtual hand or you can dial star nine if you're on the phone. And we're still waiting. All right, so we have no raised hands. Okay. Oh, um, we have one now. Oh. So okay. Our, okay, <laughs> so we have one raised hand right now. Okay, well, based on the number of speakers in the queue, each speaker will be given two minutes to speak. We encourage you to submit any written testimony you have as well. Uh, Linda, will you please provide any further instructions and then begin when uh, you can please provide the hearing testimony? Yeah. So I will announce whose turn it is to provide public testimony as well as announcing who is up next. When you're announced for public testimony, you will be promoted to a Zoom panelist, which will allow you to unmute and turn on your video if you choose. Please do not unmute or turn on your video until it's your turn to, um, for public testimony. Please start by clearly stating your name, your address, and whether you're in support, opposition, or neutral to the proposal. 
Public testimony is up to three minutes long. And when your public testimony is concluded, you will be returned to the Zoom attendee status. If any technical difficulties are encountered, we will move on to the next person in the queue and try again after that person's comment. With these instructions out of the way, our first person will be CLN. And I'm adding you as a panelist now for one more moment. Okay, so you should be able to unmute. Are you having any technical difficulties? So I see you unmute it, but we can't quite hear you. Okay, so Celan is the only person that we have with a raised hand, and they're the only person in the queue. Um, and I'm thinking they're having some technical difficulties. Um, we could wait about a minute or two and see how this pans out. Let's see. I'd say let's wait a minute, but then also. Uh it's okay to, to write your written testimony and submit to both the planning commissions uh, of the county and the city, and we'll be sure to read it and enter it into the record. There's a comment there in the chat you might read, Dan. It sounds like their their microphone is having some issues. So what I would, again, what I would suggest is uh, that the um, testimony be submitted the email to the planning staff and maybe ask planning staff to reach out um, to this person to make sure that they have the ability to do so and have been instructed on how to do so. Ms. Baker, I believe that that concludes our, our uh, roster or queue, correct? It does. Well, thank you everyone for taking time out to of your evening to share your thoughts before us. Before we close the meeting, is there a staff response to that? Well, the staff doesn't have, we don't have any testimony, excuse me for that. Uh, do we have any questions uh, from the Eugene commissioners for staff from the Eugene side? I'm not seeing any. Chair Dignam. Wayne County Planning Commissioners. I'll go ahead and ask one question. Uh, I asked it in the work session. I want to ask it in a slightly different way to uh, our staff, to Jack. Can you tell me, t explain again or confirm again that the number of changes that we made locally were effectively nil, that we adopted DLCD standards or we're proposing to adopt DLCD standards, except there were four optional items, but those four items were already in place. And therefore there are no new, more restrictive code amendments being proposed by staff at this time. Yeah, that's correct. There are the, the the four optional items that we included were were the only um, items that were not that did not come from the DLCD code for minimum requirements. That's correct. Because, but those are already in the city of Eugene code, isn't that correct? The the the, the first bullet point about three board, which is a factor of safety that is the only one that was existing that, that is existing in code right now the other three came from the dlcd model code and do are not currently in um in the existing code oh i see as, as it's effective right now yeah so those so yeah so those would be new rec those are new recommendations very good thanks for that clarification Last chance, uh, Lane County Planning Commissioners. It appears that there are no further questions, uh, Daniel. 
At this time, we would normally close the public hearing and the Planning Commission's record. Is there any commissioner from either jurisdiction who wishes to continue the hearing to another time or to hold the record open for additional written testimony? Well, Daniel, uh, here, let me, I can raise my hand or let me, I, I thought you had just said that you were going to recommend that the person who was trying to provide testimony be given an option and an opportunity to provide testimony via a written manner since she couldn't seem to, I don't know if it's here, she couldn't seem to get uh, the technical things correct. So if we close the record, that that doesn't work. I need a motion from somebody to extend the record. Actually, you you don't. So this is one of the, I've worked a lot with both planning commissions, Berlin County and Eugene. And technically in a legislative matter like this one, the record never really closes. In Eugene, we do a practice that um, I think the planning commission refers to as a soft close to basically draw a line sort of on what the planning commission is considering in its recommendation, but it like if this individual decides to submit testimony, say in writing, that would definitely be collected and provided uh, to the elected officials and their decision making. So we would still definitely encourage if even if the record is soft closed for the Eugene Planning Commission, we would encourage this individual and anyone else who's interested to provide testimony it will be considered by the ultimate decision makers. Um, Lane County, I believe, correct me if I'm wrong, Steve, doesn't doesn't actually talk about closing the record for legislative matters. Is that correct? All right. Jared, Lindsay, help me out. What, sh what Lindsay, should the I county do? You're correct, Emily. Um, we do accept uh, additional testimony um, until the decision is made. And I would recommend, so speaking to the Eugene Planning Commission, although it's uncharacteristic for how you normally um, do business, I would recommend that tonight you simply decide whether or not you're closing the public hearing. And if in fact, I mean, you could make a recommendation tonight, you know, with so little, um, you didn't get anything in writing, except I think you had one thing attached to your packet. Um, and then you didn't get much from a public hearing. You could do a recommendation tonight. You could get together as individuals and make a recommendation separately later. Um, but there's no need to really close the record because we'll continue to accept things. And whenever you make your decision, we'll provide uh, you or your elected officials with whatever we've received up to that time. So um, Dan, you can just decide whether to close the public hearing and we'll leave the record aside just so we can act in the same way as Lane County. Commissioner Freckle. Considering that there is an individual that um, would like to provide testimony after this date, um, without discussing whether or not we're closing the record, I would like to move that we close the public hearing and um, no, don't I don't have an interest in making a motion tonight. Commissioner Arwood. Uh, my apologies. I I I don't want to speak for the um individual who was attempting to testify, but I there was comment in there regarding the webcast and both the city and county live meeting sites do not have a broadcast. And that's what I believe that person was trying to say. So I don't know that they want to testify um, about this particular issue. I just wanted to point that out uh, to staff, just so you knew that there, there was not a public broadcast happening, according to my uh, checking. Mm -hmm. So that's it. All right, well, with that, I think that uh, we have a sense we have a motion on the floor, um, which I don't know that we need a motion, but we have one to, to close the public hearing and leave. Um, obviously, the record open is what we normally would do anyway. So um, I'm just going to do this by acclamation that we close the public hearing and uh, move on. Um, I believe that moves it to uh, you, Chair Dignam, to do the same from the Planning Commission from the county. Thank you. Just Daniel. point of, sorry, point of, did you, so I'm sorry, Commissioner Patrick, did you, sorry, Commissioner Isaacson, 
Uh, you just like that Dan Patrick. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, did you make a motion? The motion was uh, was I, I I don't know that we necessarily need one for Commissioner Freckle. It did I mean we can go, we can do a vote if we okay. need. I uh, think there, I think a motion was made. Commissioner Freckle made a motion. I did, but it wasn't seconded. Okay, so we need a second. We need to vote on that, and that's fine. And that's that's how we'll do it um, okay. before we do a motion from the county, just to keep things straight. If I can second, I'll second it. You can. Sure. I'll second it. And we are only voting for the Eugene side, correct? Yeah, and the only question is whether or not to close the public hearing. Okay. Um, is there any debate on the motion? Seeing no debate, call a question. Um, all those in favor on the Eugene side, the Eugene Planning Commission, of closing the public hearing. Raise your hand, please. Okay. It passes unanimously. The, the, the public hearing is closed. And then, Commissioner Dingham, you can decide whether or not you want to do it through a motion, what your normal practice is to close the hearing tonight. Yes, thank you very much. Do we have an equivalent motion from Lane County? I move that we close the public hearing. Do we have a second? Bruce? I have a second. I saw Bruce raise his hand, so I'm going to say that was our second. Any further discussion? Not seeing any. All in favor, signify by saying aye or raising your hand. Any opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Back to you, Chair. Thank you. The Eugene Planning Commission is holding time on its October 11th agenda to deliberate and make a recommendation on this matter. The Eugene Planning Commission, or excuse me, the Lane County Planning Commission is holding its time on November 15th agenda to do the same. On uh, I guess uh, on behalf of both planning commissions, thank you for joining us and speaking tonight. The meeting of the Eugene Planning Commission is now adjourned. And I will go ahead and adjourn this meeting of the uh, Lane County Planning Commission.